Hello, everyone. Can I get your attention, please? Um, I'm, going, I'm here tasked to introduce this lovely man. Uh, for those of you who don't, you're going to learn a lot about him uh, in a bit. So, Toronto, Portland, Hong Kong, Phnom Penh. All, these are all the places I've been with Chris, who is all about travel, all about movement, about putting himself out there in the unknown, willing to be changed by the encounters. And now, in Vancouver, at UBC, in the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands and territory of the Muslim people, I get to learn to work and live beside my friend in this place. We get to be on a different journey. I'm sure many of you here already know Christopher B. Patterson, but if, you've, if you're in the class with him. But for those of you who, um, who don't know who he is, let me say a little bit about him. He's an assistant professor in the Social Justice Institute. His research focuses on trans-specific discourses of literature, games, and films. He studies these artworks through the lens of empire studies, queer theory, and creative writing. 2018 has been a very good year for Chris, and let me tell you why. Uh, <laughs> his academic book, uh, Transitive Culture, Anglophone Literature of the Trans-Pacific was published this year. Let's just acknowledge that. <laughs> this work traces identity transition across Southeast Asian migrant narratives. One aspect of this book that I continue to marvel at is how is Chris's attention to ways uh, Southeast Asian authors use art as modes of building inter-ethnic alliances and critiquing power structures in both Southeast Asia and in North America. As if that's not enough, he has another book out this year. It's a bit annoying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing about this book. You won't find the book under Christopher Patterson. This is why. Chris, you see, he leads a double life. <laughs> he writes fiction uh, under the pseudonym Kawika uh, Guillermo, the Hawaiian Filipino name given to him by his mother. It is under Kawika that you come across his 2018 novel titled Stamped, an anti travel novel. And so, if you want to find any other of his short stories and other writers, it won't be under Christopher Patterson. So, go under that name and you'll find. He's, he has worked in uh, the Feminist Studies, the Drunken Boat, Hawaii Pacific Review, and he's quite annoyingly prolific. <laughs> he's also a fiction editor for The Comp Magazine and a bi-monthly writer for The Anomaly Magazine. As if this kind of production, again, isn't uh, enough, I admire, one of the things I admire, one of the many things I admire about Chris is how active of an organizer uh, and cultural worker he is in Asian American networks. For four years, he organized the Asian American Studies Research Collective at the University of Washington before spending two more years as a program director and grant writer for the Seattle Asian American Film Festival. <coughs> Currently, he is the host of a podcast, uh, New Books in Asian American Studies, where he has interviewed over 30 scholars about their work. Canada is the fourth country Chris has emigrated to, uh, as he spent uh, a year in South Korea, two years in mainland China, and under two in Hong Kong. Please help me welcome Dr. Christopher, uh, Christopher Patterson. Thank you so much, Fenwell, for that um, warm welcome. Um, I was a bit nervous coming up, but I feel a lot of love and support from that, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Denise for asking me to present today, uh, to Carmen and Wynne for allowing this talk to uh, stretch their organizing capacity for the year, and to all of you for coming. I also want to acknowledge that the, this event is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and that meaning to me that meaning of, many of us are, in a sense, inhabiting a space that belongs to others. <laughs> 
I want to begin with a very brief reading from uh, Stamped, the first page. This is in the voice of Skylar Farallon, um, who is 20 years old and has just ventured out of the US for the first time in his life. Uh, Think Travel blog book, post date, 2007, March 6th. User, Sky Farallon. The plan is to travel until the pain runs you over, but Bangkok was the worst place to start. It's just too easy here in the land of smiles. Instead of a long, pathetic decay, you find food so cheap you couldn't possibly starve, people so beautiful you couldn't possibly be lonely, a police force strictly to protect foreigners, a hotel room for $7, cheap massages that taunt your hopes of perishing in a blaze of hardcore travel glory. And because you are as brown as the fried cricket snacks that tantalize every street stall, you get to stroll into historic temples through the locals only line. You can slide into an American coffee shop and shoot the breeze with lady boys about their foreigner clients. You laugh at them, the white men, calling them big hairy gorillas. Here, the rules of the game have changed. Your race card has turned wild. So this is the opening to the novel Stamped, which just came out in August of this year. But I actually began writing this excerpt um, 10 years ago in 2008 when I first visited Bangkok and ended up taking the typical banana, what they call the banana pancake tour from Thailand through Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. It's a trip that I always look upon as a political coming of age. I was 22, fresh from my first year in graduate school, where I was beginning to specialize in Asian American studies, literatures concerning empire, racism, and travel. Being in Southeast Asia for months at a time gave palpable presence to histories of bombing, war, and colonization, which prior I could only understand abstractly within the safety and comfort of my North American institution. It also brought to my attention how travel itself was embedded within colonial networks. All of this I wanted to bring back with me to let spring whatever work could emerge and to create disruptions in places complicit in, but largely unaffected by, the violences that have taken place across the sea. I became an accidental academic in 2008 when I took refuge from the precarity guaranteed by the recession and decided to stay in graduate school. It was also in 2008 that I started writing uh, these two books, my fiction book, Stamped, and my academic book, Transitive Cultures. The research and love of literature that spurred my fiction did the same for my academic writing. I did not intend for these works to come out together. This one took three years to publish. Uh, though looking back, I understand them now as sharing the same resources of delving deep into imperial histories in Asia and in travel itself. If there's anything worse than an academic who writes fiction, it's the fiction writer who explains their stories through academic language. In this talk, I hope to break these and many other rules. Yes, I want to talk about travel and the ideas in both of these books that emerge from travel, but I also want to discuss what it means to do creative work within the institution, which can be both a resource for creative and academic work, as well as an entity seeking to see the author as a source, as the OED defines it, a place, person, or thing from which something comes or can be obtained. In a recent piece for PMLA, Viet Thanh Nguyen wrote that, quote, only as an English language writer of fiction, rather than as an English professor, could I acknowledge Vietnamese bodies. Constrained by committees, editors, and other academic gatekeepers, Nguyen could not center Vietnamese people as subjects, even in scholarship, about the very war that took place on their soil. Creative work emerged for him as a form of communicating what academic methods could not see. As Barbara Christian famously wrote in 1987, quote, people of color have always theorized, but in forms quite different from the Western form of abstract logic. And I am inclined to say that our theorizing and I intentionally use the verb rather than the noun, is often in narrative forms, in the stories we create, in riddles and proverbs, in the play with language, because dynamic rather than fixed ideas seem more to our liking. Of these writers, W.E.B. Du Bois, whose souls of black folk merged poetry, fiction, and essay, is seen as a great grandfather, while today writers like Viet Nguyen, Sadia Hartman, Shirley Gulkin Lim, Fred Moten, Larissa Lai, and others, I would point to Fanwell here, <laughs> continue to blend scholarship and creativity today. What defines this work to me are authors who do the research, do the work, but express that work through imagination and play, as the serious world of traditional academic methods fails to capture the unique life of the person or the community that they call home, 
Creative scholarship dares one to follow their instinct rather than their grant, grant outline, to write not with templates but with surprise, as Christian emphasizes, quote, the surprise that comes from reading something that compels you to read differently. When the expectations of traditional scholarship have left us desperately scrounging to see humanity, creative work surprises with flesh and soul. For my first year as an undergraduate, I was living in Las Vegas at the time, uh, I imagined embarking upon this creative path of fiction workshops and creative writing mentorship. That is until one workshop when our class was given the rare opportunity to read a piece of classic literature as an example of good craft-based writing. The piece was George Orwell's Shooting an Elephant, a story set in Burma when it was a British colony and narrated by a British policeman who was, quote, all for the Burmese and all against their oppressors, the British. I have never forgotten this story's end, its prevailing insight that, quote, every white man's life in the East was one long struggle not to be laughed at. My fellow students and instructor did not see what I saw. They saw the story as a shining example of craft, how the elephant turned from an it to a he, how he operated as an analog to the people of Burma. I found none of this half as interesting as the context. Where was Burma anyways? What was it really like to be a colonial there? Was it possible to contain such a private life of doubt, even as a soldier within a violent and racist empire? I wanted to discuss these questions, but when I did, I was met with criticism that I was not reading like an artist, that I was too taken in by the story. I was merely the part Chinese, part Filipino, part white person in the room, a descendant of both colonials and colonial subjects. And to say that the story meant more to me because of that history seemed to ignore the all-important dimension of craft that purposefully mystified process, that great divider between the failure, failed story and the ones praised in serious literary journals. I found myself in the same situation as Juno Diaz when he wrote of the Cornell MFA, quote, we never talked about race except on the rare occasion someone wanted to argue that race discussions were exactly the discussion a serious writer should not be having. Off put by MFA writing courses and agog to see the world, I scuttled my plans for an MFA and took the path of travel, holding dear to the notion that it was more important to have something to say than to learn to say it well. For five months, I wandered North America hitchhiking, ride sharing, couch sharing, hosteling, and seeking out strange encounters. My thickest memory still is crossing into Canada for the first time, when after telling the border guards that I was both unemployed and broke, I was forced to lift my shirt and jump up and down while Canadian guards tore through my beat up sedan only to recover from the trunk a Chicago-style pizza that had spent weeks decaying in the summer heat. <laughs> After North America, I spent a year in South Korea and then spent my graduate years flitting briefly from country to country, Japan, China, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, India, and of course, uh, Myanmar, before settling to live for two years in Nanjing, China, and another two in Hong Kong. Throughout this relentless push into other people's lands, I tried to think about ways of travel and movement that, like Orwell's story, could infiltrate imperial power and unmask its many strong-armed faces. The first travel book I came to love was Andrew Pham's Catfish and Mandala, a story about a v Vietnamese American refugee who cycles through the Pacific Rim in Vietnam to come to grips with his sister's suicide. The next was Lawrence Chua's novel Go By the Inch, the story of a gay Malaysian Thai American who zips through his former homelands in pursuit of erotic sex the more punishing, the better. As a fan of these travel novels, it didn't occur to me until I started teaching travel literature at the University of Washington that travel fiction was actually known as the last edifice of white male territory, a floating lighthouse with its bright beam scanning eagerly for the next exotic destination. Until recently, people of color have been locked out of travel narratives, so that color only remained with the hyper-colorful na natives. Rare was the travel book written by a woman, and even rarer, the travel book written by a woman of color. As Edward Said, Mary Louise Pratt, and many others have argued, travel writing has been a staple of Western colonialism since at least the grand tours of the 17th century, when young hipster-like Europeans tossed about on the new colonial infrastructure, comparing themselves to others that they saw as backward, uncivilized, perverse heathens. The grand tour travelers would eventually become colonial administrators, overseeing civilizing projects, just as travelers today scatter the world like hover probes, scanning for cultural mores, only to return and use their acquired intel to optimize the strengths of the imperial Death Star that is North America.
The lure to travel is also the lure of being seen as an expert, whether that expertise is meant for CIA reconnaissance or to write books on how to pick up Asian women. At the same time, travel does result in writers like Mark Twain, an anti-imperialist who gave the timeless edict that, quote, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people, Americans, need it sorely on these accounts. After I taught my first semester of canonical travel writing, I grew obsessed with finding my people, meaning those addicted to travel, not because it was educational or fun, but because some despair in the American experience drove them to do it again and again. My people were not in travel anthologies, even the kind that included the hypermasculine writings of Ernest Hemingway, V.S. Naipaul, or Amitav Ghosh. I yearned to consume not the incense or spices of another land, but to smell the author's own shit, to sniff out whatever guilty pleasures they had hidden within them, and to understand from where they came. I longed to feel something dull enough to keep me guessing, sassy enough to give me the once over, and something so braided within the uncertain destinies of racial others that it provoked self-destruction, sent me plunging off the levitating plane of the self and into the messy contradictions of pleasure, desire, and power. Once outside this canon of travel literature, those othered, unruly, and willful travel writers were not too difficult to find. One was Jamaica Kincaid, whose novel A Small Place saw the smile of the Antiguan na native not as expressing admiration, but envy. Another was Zora Neale Hurston, who traveled as an anthropologist collecting black folklore, zipping through the South in a stylish car, a shotgun always at arm's length. Then there were writers who traveled to find freedom, Richard Wright, Nina Simone, James Baldwin, those who did not seek to travel to Europe, but rather to leave America. I saw myself in novels like Ars Amora Lindmark's novel Leche, about a Filipino-Hawaiian gay traveler who returns to the Philippines and hates everything there until he is so broken by the place that he finds pleasure in the pain of failure, if only he would unclinch. Through these travel authors, I began to understand my own need for movement. What attracted me was not the pleasures of the grand tour, but my own desire for exile, as Edward Said defines it, as a state of never being fully adjusted, of tending to avoid and even dislike the trappings of accommodation and national well-being, of inhabiting a metaphysical sense of restlessness movement, and of constantly being unsettled and unsettling others. At home, race was always lived as a dust-layered filter that only let through the most sanitized ways of being. The limitless plurality of possible selves felt always reduced to a few. But when I traveled, race turned to strangeness, to the unknown, or as I wrote in the first page of Stamped, your race card has turned wild. The constraints of racial otherness remained, yet no longer was I pinned to the same set of familiar types. If you're looking to sit down, there's some space over here. Okay. Uh, for marginalized people of all stripes, travel from one country to another is not transitioning from being an insider to an outsider, but from being an outsider to a different kind of outsider, to realizing that there is not merely one way to be excluded. Loss emerges by being othered anew. Who am I without comparing myself to straight, white, cisgendered men? What could I become when whiteness no longer lurks on every horizon? Going abroad, we find that the forms of otherness are vast, multitudinous, each with their own gravity and dangers of crashing. But in the somewhat finicky means of wrestling down our own self-worth, we find new ways to orbit what others call freedom. So I'll try and give a Another brief reading. I have five in total, <laughs> so prepare yourself. Um, in Stamped, one of Skylar's um, friends, uh, Sophia, ends up ditching her travel group to wander the streets of Mumbai. Feverishly ambulant, she strives to outpace the anger uh, welting inside her, formed from a year of witnessing the effects of American empire throughout Southeast Asia. So she's been traveling for about a year, but it's her first time in, um, in India. Sophia plunged into Mumbai's swarming streets of people, blended together in the evening's soft golden glow. A group of women squeezed her with their bellies, an undulating stream of piss flowed between her sandals, coming from a small boy facing a brick wall. A cycle rickshaw's wheel smashed a pile of cow shit, and a swarm of flies sniffed the fresh aperture. Nearby, some yo young local man checked her out. That got her thinking of Skylar, the unbuttoned Skylar in a collared shirt. Skylar in a collar, barking. Skylar, his arms around me, arms around Skylar with no kiss. 
Scholar on that day in Phnom Penh, after we accidentally flipped a table full of drinks, a useless but encouraging smile. Scholar on my last day in Seoul, after I mustered the gall to kiss him. But it was a pity kiss. Scholar kissed with pity. Travel was supposed to free them, but that mixed up wannabe flaneur only got nastier with every new city. Why can't you get over it? Scholar had told her just before she left. You can be anyone you want to in Asia. Do anything. You're not just some weak minority anymore. That's what they want you to think. She could never understand how easy it was for him to transform himself. Could she stop being Cambodian? Stop being a refugee? Stop the history, the memory of her family, the debts that she owed? And yet, as if to prove him right, here she was, going anywhere she wanted. India, a place she had never cared to go. So she tried not to remember much. Remembering had to be rationed. Most of life, she found, needed no memories, no thinking about who she was, what her family went through, her upbringing in the States, all those onerous histories. Memory had driven her mad once. Every recollection had peeled away the membrane, protecting her sanity. Now she intended to keep herself, to keep her head no matter what. So she let go of memory and gave herself to the feeling of being swallowed by the things around her, the dogs, the piss, the cows, the shit, the camels, the geckos, the touts, the urchins, the legless beggars, the fleas, the dirt, the exhaust, the heat, the sun's inescapable glow. So for me as for Sophia um, in this passage, traveling to Asia has inadvertently revealed the inner workings of empire, its hidden violences, its afterlife, and the inability for great powers to account for their own war crimes, their responsibilities in genocide, crop burning, starvation, disease, and massacre. But travel can also reveal empire's contemporary mode of governance, something I call in my academic book, Pluralist Governmentality. By this, I seek to capture an art of government that expects individuals to visibly and transparently express their difference via given group identities, and in doing so, to represent imperial state power as neutral, universal, or benevolent. More important, I seek to use this term to understand the capricious nature of concepts that traffic freely between North America and Asia, concepts like tolerance, multiculturalism, minority, and identity, and to understand how they are recast by state and imperial powers to curate the images emblazoned onto the nation and to assert control over realms where unruly bodies circulate. The idea for this term came to me while traveling when I realized that multiculturalist exceptionalism was everywhere, that every country I visited had convinced itself that they had handled the minority question better than others, and that in each state, multiculturalism was not only seen as in its near perfect form, but that it had originated from that country itself. Of course, Australia, Canada, and the US are all guilty of circulating these narratives, but other empires like the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China have also had similar multicultural narratives of their own. In other work, I've shown that even the Mongol Empire, one of the most murderous and massacre-driven powers in world history, is today read by many historians as a great example of tolerance and multiculturalism. But it was while traveling through Asia that I first became interested in how post-colonial countries, like Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines, saw multiculturalism not as a progressive social policy, but as a reiterated form of colonial pluralism. Here, claims to diversity were seen by many local writers and artists as part of an imperial form of control and domination. Hoping to avoid, as Vijay Mishra has put it, quote, the tendency to read multiculturalism as a purely Western phenomenon, I traveled to these spaces and studied their national and diasporic literatures to find that many artists and thinkers found multiculturalist politics an overly surveilled and barren form of resistance. I was infatuated especially with the writings of Lloyd Fernando, the first local novelist in Singapore and Malaysia, whose novel Scorpion Orchid took on multiple perspectives from people of different races, genders, and sexualities. This book was so radically against the colonial pluralism of its time that Fernando had to literally stare at himself in the mirror before writing and repeat to himself, I am not a racist, I am not a racist, I am not a racist. Others followed in these footsteps, Suchen Christian Lim, who wrote of multicultural women in mixed relationships, Ninochka Roska and Afrid Yusan in the Philippines, who wrote of the Filipino, as Oscar Campomenes has put it, 
as bearing, quote, the brand of U.S. empire on his forehead. In these stories, I found radical thinkers who saw symbols of diversity as part of the left behind colonial architecture and instead focused on inequality, human rights atrocities, refugee migrations, the afterlife of war, and contemporary imperial violence. So what did all this mean, I wondered, for my own Asian American identity? As Fedwell pointed out, I'm very invested in this identity. Um, an identity that began as a political response to the injustices of the Vietnam War and the denial of civil rights, but like many forms has been appropriated into the state's mission to control the production and circulation of difference. Even so, within much Asian American literature, I too found moments of radical upset, particularly in texts focusing on travel experiences. Books like Han Ong's The Disinherited and Peter Betcho's Cebu, both about Filipinos traveling and wearing different guises. Books by Shirley Gyoklin Lim, Jessica Hagedorn, Madeline Tien, Ruth Ozeki, and Chris Lee. But in the act of travel, migration, and cross-cultural writing, many of these authors also appeared less visible to North American politics. Their texts were often seen as inauthentic or as written by outsiders, as they focused on characters not deserving of sympathy, but who sought to manage, revise, and transition among various ethnic identities within each new space they traveled. Rather than offer transparency concerning their race, gender, sexuality, uh, and privilege, their stories brought ambivalence, ambiguity, and obscurity. I sought then to understand the way travelers sought to expel identity alongside expelling their own homeland. Or as James Baldwin wrote, how, quote, real change demands the end of identity, the end, the end of safety. In my academic book, I draw on migrant and travel texts to uncover forms of cultural belonging from groups speaking within roots of inauthenticity. Their literature compels us to confront Southeast Asian history, wherein identities have been produced at the nexus of multiple imperial projects and competing post-colonial states. These texts offer methods for rethinking race eccentrically as well as eccentrically that forces us to shift from frameworks that reinstitute national categories by seeing marginalized people as diasporic victims caught between a homeland and a host country, or as symbols tethered to the nation's own narrative of multiculturalism. The view from these texts suggests that the given ways of talking about ourselves are often part of the productive afterlife of colonial pluralism, when the complex political histories of homelands are routinely simplified and defined solely by their relationship to the Western power, marking migrancy as always a progressive act, since diasporic peoples, we are told, never seek refuge from North America. My book then seeks to spotlight practices of transition that occur in travel, the way changing, shifting, and renaming occurs through migrancy and strategic planning, so that what appears inauthentic does not also appear apolitical. Crucial to this exploration is thinking about mobility, exile, and travel as enabling forms of transition that negotiate alternative attitudes towards race and identity. And by, by mobility, I mean all the mobilities that come with movement, the social mobility, mobility of information, capital, and identity itself. The desire for travel often speaks to the desire to escape one's fixed identity. But in doing so, travelers also invoke new comparisons that consider how race functions in different contexts. These travel texts that I write about urge us to see racial identity itself as a process of unceasing transitions that shifts with every new context, a process that can be controlled, reimagined, and with enough savvy, made pleasurable. So let's pause and rejoin Sophia on the streets of Mumbai. And this, she has been walking all night. Night has fallen. Oh, Gigantic bats flew above her. Stray dogs howled around her. The smell of smoked corn from a street stall wafted by as she stood in line for another cigar. Her hand went fumbling into her pocket for bits of change. How long would she walk? When would her feet give her back the controls? She followed a stream, not caring where it led. To walk was a requirement. To move was to stay a beat beyond that crushing nothing, striving to outpace her. But movement was also a luxury. Merely to go one foot in front of the other, crossing streets, bridges, and demarcations felt extravagant. Rain fell in a torrent. She kept under awnings, skipping upon loose bricks. A cycle rickshaw blew water onto her waist. The street ahead flooded, and she waded into the water, feeling the breeze pass over her sandals. She held her backpack taut against her palms, her hands checking each zipper to secure her passport, her wallet, 
and that purple gachai hat that she had bought at a hawker stall. Curious eyes stared her down, this western brown woman so far from the tourist district. If life was a karma game, it seemed stacked against her. It was unfair that her brothers could cut through a garden park in the middle of the night in Oakland, fully confident, undaunted by the eyes about them. She hadn't planned to walk all night, but her feet showed no sign of stopping. They moved in a rage, possessed by the spirit that hated her lot in life. She hated white people sometimes, hated America more often, and all of that hate bewildered her. There was so much logic in it, so much reason, so much justification, and so many lies, so many bombs, so much death, so much hypocrisy, that anyone else who didn't also hate America must have been rejoicing and living in some white power fantasy. There was plenty of hate to make up for, plenty to take on. She passed a child pleading for coin. She gave 10 rupees and the boy scuttled off into a large tunnel made of cardboard. She followed him into a, into a market. Feathers and blood and chicken flesh splattered around her feet, bunched together bullfrogs croaked from inside red plastic nets. A giant turtle stuck its head from a blue grocery bag. She wondered how old it was, if it was in this world before her. If my academic book sought to see the transitive as a quiet, unintelligible, and unrecognized practice, Stamp seeks to mine the lived experience of travel for minority, queer, and poor folks who find their homespun identities unspooling when they attempt to settle elsewhere. Sorry. <laughs> Inspired by many of the migrant and travel narratives written by Lloyd Fernando, Ma Jian, and Lawrence Chua, Stamped revolves around four travelers who feel dejected from America and seek out new spaces as, at first as a means of escape, but eventually as ways to reimagine their homeland and themselves. The novel is about people looking for playful mirrors, seeing themselves, confronting themselves, then being unable to account for the violence that emerges. Resolving never to go back to America, the characters weave through the afterlife of colonial histories, the Cambodian genocide, the Philippine-American war, and the many military bases scattered throughout the Pacific. One of the central focuses, I use, as I try to emphasize in this excerpt, is anger. Anger, as Audre Lorde wrote, should not be feared, but should be something we learn to deal with, to orchestrate from cacophony into symphony, quote, so that those furies do not tear us apart. While writing Stamped, I wanted to explore how the anger that manifests from travel can be reshaped by galvanizing forces, but can also be domesticated the ready-made narratives, the local nationalist propaganda, the tourist industry, the internalized imperial attitudes. These forces turned anger from discordance into anthem, shifting the, shifting the blame by trumpeting a gruesome chorus of self-hate, racism, and possession. One of the inspirations for the novel was seeing how anyone is susceptible to this, even the cadre of frequently sloshed queer black POC travelers within the novel who act upon Asia with whatever latitude their privileges afford, chasing their own ends until they are undone by the road. How does one get out of this chronic mess, I ask myself, while writing? What risk does one need to take? What comes with the loss of an identity that has, time and again, made and remade the self? To be stamped, I feel, is to be flattened, stomped upon by the modern colossus crushing anything in its path. So there's the flattening of the will, the stamping of racial otherness, the reduction of minorities into one-dimensional political identities that we call resistant. But then, to be stamped is also to have access. The same stamp that was created through flattening and dehumanizing also enables mobility and some amount of privilege. The very thing one tries to escape, the apparatus holding the stamp, also provides inclusion. But what do we give up? What is the price of admission into a space where our actions, our thoughts, our embodiments are no longer ours? They are not ours in a sense that we are no longer responsible for those actions, our feelings, our anxieties, even our own histories. Responsibility has been replaced with the institution, the apparatus, the state. In that loss of responsibility, what else do we lose? And I really don't have answers for those questions. <laughs> so I'm still, that's why I'm asking them. Um, all I can say is that when I travel, I feel responsible again. Responsibility arrives merely in the act of seeing, of bearing witness to the atrocities of the past, and in recognizing the reach of empire today. As Aaron Hardy Roy writes, quote, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, 
keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. I'm curious on how travelers account for this accountability when they realize that they cannot go back home because they know too much to be the person they once were. They have, in a sense, become responsible for who they are, even when they, all they want is to be no one at all. OK, let's finally return to Sophia's story. <laughs> um, she has walked all night, and dawn is finally starting to break. Finally, her legs begin to give. Finally, exhaustion begin to reach her, as if gravity could aim its forceful pull onto her alone, forcing her to stop. She turned down the nearest alleyway, crawled her arms against stone walls, and sat on a plastic chair. She ended up in a square courtyard, somewhere within the maze-like complex of windowless rooms. No one bothered her. She just sat, staring at her sandals. To transform herself was a foolish dream, the karma, the rightful place. She understood now why there was so little anger back where she grew up, why it all went to her. There was no beating it, no thinly disguised wire she could cut that would bring the entire imperial apparatus down, no weakness that could explode everything in a single Death Star crashing victory. If it could not be beaten, what use was there to hate it? The answer was never as radical, never as rebellious as she wanted it. Defeat or be defeated, she knew how to keep moving along an unknown path. I wrote stamped under my pseudonym Kavika, the name my mother wanted me to have, and her maiden name Guillermo. Under this name, I have published over 50 short stories, creative nonfiction essays, and interviews. And I love this term, annoyingly pro prolific. <laughs> I'm going to try and own that or steal it. <laughs> um, Kavika was also the name of the last Hawaiian king who coincidentally loved travel and became the first monarch to ever circumnavigate the globe. But as I write in the back of Stamped, I don't see Kavika as my own name, but more of a band name or a roof rather than an individual with the many collaborators listed in the acknowledgments. I don't feel it right to individualize a 10-year project that grew from conversations with so many travelers and from absorbing so many stories. As Virginia Woolf once wrote, to produce creative work takes a large edifice, a web of structural forces made by, quote, the work and suffering of human beings and is attached to grossly material things like health and money and the houses we live in. And I, as a father of a one-year-old, um, need to add here the importance of childcare. Among these, I also have a doctorate in literature, a stamp that gives me access to libraries, research tools, and all that comes with institutional power. So here I want to add some brief impressions on creative work within the institution. In 1987, Barbara Christian observed that, quote, in the first part of this century, at least in England and America, the critic was usually, was usually also a writer of poetry, plays, or novels. But today, as a new generation of professionals develops, she or he is increasingly an academic. I've known many academics who are also artists, many of whom are also creative writers, and many of whom who feel that they are always an outsider in literary circles. But I don't see what's so bad about being an outsider to literature today. For in terms of real diversity, literary culture in the US, at least, is bottom of the barrel. 88% of the books reviewed by the New York Times are written by white authors. The staff of best-selling literary journals are almost entirely white. 79% of the literary industry identifies as white, the vast majority white women, as do 89% of book review writers. Though the literary market pretends to be the arbiter of liberal tolerance, considering its gatekeepers, one would be much better off getting their diversity education from video games, whose industrial diversity is slightly better at 76% white identified developers. I wonder then what the outsiders can do for creativity the ones like me who left the MFA workshop. As Mark McGurl and Eric Bennett have shown, MFA programs emerged during the Cold War to institutionalize creativity in ways that demonize political writing, aggrandize the new Pax Americana, and gain grants and philanthropy from oil tycoons and bank owners like the Rockefellers. The Cold War context helped produce seemingly timeless proverbs of creativity. To write what you know, to always make it new, to show, not tell, to write as sparingly and as masculine as Ernest Hemingway. These and other craft-based epistemologies have, over time, excluded people of color, devalued socially engaged genre fiction, and debased non-liberal politics. 
These values were also weaponized in Asia during the Cold War with CIA-funded literary projects funneled through programs like the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the Asia Foundation, and many of the literary festivals still in place in Asia today. In North America, people of color have also not been shy about criticizing these writing norms. As the author Ken Leo writes, quote, to write from resistance, telling is sometimes far superior than showing. Showing is great when you're relying on a shared implicit understanding. I too was taught that these writing techniques were universal, with stories like shooting an elephant being their greatest examples. But when I taught creative writing in Hong Kong and China, I found altogether different presumptions. One should write about politics. One could never get away with pretending objectivity. One should not be original, but write in respect to tradition, culture, and community. In both China and the Philippines, its great founding fathers were not statesmen, but also fiction writers, Lu Xuan and Jose Rizal. In places like Singapore, it's not unusual for its most recognized fiction writers and poets to also be lawyers and state representatives. Close reading and close attention to craft in these contexts can be seen as imperial handovers. And most shocking for me was the belief in many of my students that literary fiction was totally banal compared to the radical work happening in science fiction, fantasy, and young adult novels, which all carried clear political analogies. At the, same writers, these, at the same time, these writers dared to set the English language adrift, playing with language through pigeons, accents, and hybrid forms. If one were to take an account of all the publishing houses and literary journals run by people of color, they would find one common trait. The use of language and quotations from texts students are likely to read, not in the MFA course, but in ethnic studies, gender studies, and here in the Social Justice Institute. Anomaly Magazine, a magazine I write bi-monthly articles for, is dedicated to showing the work of trans, queer, indigenous, black, and people of color. Many of its editors and organizers are graduate students or are working within the academy. The, ma the major Asian Pacific Islander literary journals, like the Asian American Literature Review, the Kartika Review, and others, are run by Asian American Studies scholars like Paul Lai, who is also a published poet. This is even true in science fiction, where many major journals publishing marginalized people, like Strange Horizons, advise for stories written from, quote, non-exoticizing non and well-researched positions, and that address political issues in complex and nuanced ways. While these journals may not always be led by editors in the academy, and I don't think they should be, <laughs> it would be accurate to say that they are far more informed by ethnic studies and other interdisciplinary studies writing than the many journals based in MFA programs that focus on craft and that remained colorblind in their selection process. The mission to decolonize travel writing is a crucial part of decolonizing writing itself. We should understand how prejudices towards telling rather than showing, plagiarizing rather than originality, are part of colonial attitudes that overlap with the presumptions of travel. Towering above them the presumption that we, the wayward servants to our own passions, travel so that we can leave our banal everyday work life to take pleasure in the exotic life of others, when really many of us just want to jettison ourselves as far away from the Imperial Death Star as humanly possible. But home is not the Death Star. It is, as Omar el Akkad writes, quote, the place where your opinion matters. Or as Cydia Hartman writes of her own work, creative writing in academic contexts brings about new homes by bridging theory and narrative and does not tell stories so much as commits to what she calls a storied articulation of ideas. It is, it is within the merging of ideas and the story that the writer, out of feelings of hopelessness, homelessness, and exile, can begin to create a home where they matter. So I have two minutes left. I'm going to spend it reading one last excerpt from Stamped. Um, this is, again, from the main character, Scholar Farallon. He has been in Asia for um, just over a year now. And he has um, retreated into a Korean sauna where he has spent three months cleansing his skin, cruising through different men and women, and trying and failing to write a, a short story, a short story about empire and torture and struggle and domination. September 1st, 2008. He woke in the sauna's rock-shaped cavern, where the temperature rising from the ground was a dizzying 45 degrees Celsius. His body had no more sweat to release. Strangers rotated in and out. Their language fled the atmosphere of heat and bodies, pleasure and cleanliness. From there, he went to the cold room and sat upon a bench of cracked ice. He went back and forth, 
hot and cold. Visitors sighed with pity and avoided his eyes, but they were only tourists in his land. In the small cavern bed, he began another story, as true as he could make it, about empire and torture and struggle and domination without hope. He wrote, one day you escape into a new world. You find your military in every place you visit. Everyone speaks your own language to you. Everyone admires you. You try to hide from them, ashamed of your place. But in time, after a year or so, after feeding off their excitement and delight, you allow yourself to pretend that you had done something to earn it. September 6, 2008. Nearly three months had passed since Skylar entered the sauna. But here he was, outside, blinking in the sunlight of the humid summer. He walked to the Han River, legs tense with every step. No one bothered to look at the water lapping against a beach of discarded soju bottles, cigarette cases, and rice cakes reeking in the sun. He felt the muggy sweat of the city's pollution. Knee deep in the river, he shed his shirt to feel the sun's rays bake his skin, his only home. Thank you. post-national citizenship and other forms of denationalized mm -hmm. yeah. citizenship looking at Philippine-Canadian bilateral relations. So my question is, when you speak about responsibility um, towards the end of your paper, what kind of citizenships do you think the travelers and travel writers who are talking about are exercising or demonstrating? I'm really curious. My second question is um, very simple. Um, the most famous travel writer, at least in my world, and when I was reading popular um, travelogues, was some Pico Ear or Ayer. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering, in your mapping, where would you fall um, yeah. as a uh, figure? Yeah. Um, for the responsibilities of travel question, this is something that um, I'm trying to explore a lot more in the novel than in the academic work. Uh, and one of the reasons why there's so many characters in the novel, because everyone approaches this question in a different way and has their own answers to it. Um, I don't want to give away too much of the novel, but for some of the characters, returning to that place where your opinion matters, um, to the place where your vote counts, for example, where you can be political, um, is one way of dealing with that. Um, and I'd be interested in really reading your work and research in what you're in the transnational or more cosmopolitan forms of citizenship. Um, yeah, though I'm also a bit uh, hesitant to claim cosmopolitanism either because of its um, similarly uh, uh, violent histories when it's sometimes invoked. Yeah, but I think that that's part of the question that I try to explore. Um, in the novel, and I don't know if I come up with a decent answer to it, because I think it's so peculiar for each person about how they account um, for themselves uh, in the places that they're in. But definitely for the first half or so of the novel, um, they're not accounting <laughs> for themselves very well. Um, they're not ethical, good travelers by any means, even though, and part of what um, pushes them to act in these ways is the fact that they've been marginalized so much in the United States, that they've been victims of the healthcare institution, um, the lack of healthcare, um, of racism, of um, heteropatriarchy. And so it's very difficult for them to see themselves as agents of power. Um, and in that difficulty, uh, end up reproducing imperial attitudes and causing harm to others. Um, Pico Ayer, I think, I. Um, I read also when I was trying to be more of an MFA student, and I haven't really returned to all that much, um, though the way I saw uh, his writing was a bit more abstract. Um, and so there's, I would group that into, I guess, I suppose what would be the more abstract travel writers who I think are trying to break down the, um, the conventions of literary writing by making it a bit more speculative. Yeah. 
guys. I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I was wondering if I could ask you to, uh, I'm curious about the fact that you uh, describe or name your novel as travel writing. Yeah. Is it also at the same time migrant writing? And if so, and or if it isn't, then what are the relationships between migrant writing and travel writing? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I've written elsewhere about why I call this an anti-travel novel, is the subtitle for it. Um, and it's actually, that subtitle came um, because my partner thought it, it loved the subtitle, and I was really iffy about it, but then she convinced me to keep it. Um, so I've had to kind of own that word, <laughs> anti-travel, since then. Um, but part of my way of thinking was that this is responding to a lot of the conventions of travel literature. And so I wanted it to be read in that context as a, one way of seeing uh, the story, and uh, framing the story. Um, but it could also be migrants. Um, s many of the characters in it live in Asia or, or were born in Asia, but identify as American um, because of their upbringing, um, being born on military bases and things like that. So they are, in a sense, some of them migrant stories. But I think the novel was very difficult to get published and to understand for a lot of um, editors and agents. Um, I had like two agents, both of them um, light loved the novel, but eventually dropped it because they couldn't find the language to articulate what was happening in the novel. And so that's when I decided to frame it more as a travel or an anti-travel novel, as many books are reframed in that process of trying to get published. Yeah. Yes? Um, I really enjoy your presentation. Thank you. And um, I come from Latin America. And there, there are some novels like, like this, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I wonder how you address the issue of class in these characters. Mm -hmm. They have yeah. one class in their new country, but where the families came from. So uh, uh, you mentioned something about people from military families. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, the first, uh, one of the main characters in it is this um, white guy who grew up in Portland, Oregon. Um, then moved to Seattle to marry an Asian woman. Um, but he's very poor, and his family, and she calls his family white trash and things like that. So he's wrestling with this identity of, of poverty. Um, and he's also very resentful of minority politics and identity politics. And so the, the book actually starts out with him, um, partially because uh, I think everyone that was part of writing the novel loved that story. Um, and thought that was a great gateway into some of the themes from it. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to think about class relations um, intersectionally as well as with this, main, with this character. Um, and uh, most of the characters are quite poor. Uh, the one who was born on a military base is the only one who has um, places to live or owns housing in, in Asia, and so ends up being kind of like the daddy of the group. Um, and they all rely on him and kind of exploit him in, in certain ways. And so they're um, similar to my experience uh, when I started teaching in South Korea. I was making minimum wage for about six or seven years, which was five fifty an hour in Las Vegas, um, selling movie tickets and things like that. And when I, tra when I went to South Korea to teach English, one of the reasons was because they paid like a whopping 1,500 USD a month, which to me was like I was rich by that point. That's how I felt, making that much a month. Um, and so a lot of the people who are in these situations come from very lower class um, backgrounds. And so all the characters besides um, the one who grew up on army bases um, has to deal with that as part of um, their experience of living in America. There's time for one more question. And if not, I will ask that question. <laughs> and I ask really long questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, Chris, if you could thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering more if you could. Uh, if, well, I was wondering if you could say more about speculation or the role of speculation yeah. in style of writing, in aesthetic, or in form, um, but also in, as a kind of politics. Um, yeah. <laughs> just thinking about travel writing, uh, having a history of being um, the style of writing being in a voice that's uh, as observation, as um, as anthropology, as a study, right? So how mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I'm really against literature being seen as anthropologic or, or anything like that um, because it's fictionalized and um, sometimes those boundaries cross over in ways that are not, not so great. Um, for this novel, like once you're five pages in, you get very, two very different voices. And so I'm, I'm trying to play a bit with the ideas of authorship and the expectations of being an um, ethnicized author. Um, and so, for example, uh, one of the characters in the novel um, ends up changing um, their name uh, once going through these um, um, certain violent experiences. And the name that they change to is Kavika. And so I'm trying to kind of play with those expectations about who's writing and, and how the writer themselves um, appears in the novel. And there's, this comes from the, some of my reading from my academic book. Hen Su Yin and, and others have done this. They take on these pin names and then put those pin names inside the stories um, as a way to kind of show the audience that this is not, um, that th they're writing in a different register. And like you say, it's a more speculative register. Um, so the, in my academic book, the whole, the last two chapters are focused on um, trying to explore this type of writing, speculative writing, uh, which is, for me, is realist writing, or it appears real, but it's written from a kind of outsider or speculative point of view. Um, and what, how does that change the presumptions that we put upon ethnic writers, um, which is often to just tell their own story and be transparent about who they are, all the things that they've done, in a kind of confessional mode. And so a lot of writers have written about this. Um, Viet Nguyen, who I quoted from, has wrestled with this quite a lot. Um, and so this is, I think, starting to break down a bit more in popular culture. But it's still definitely there in the layers of like editors and trying to get agents and things like that. Um, many um, stories about ethnic writers are often coupled with stories about how they had to um, perform in a certain identity type for their agents and for their editors. Right? They're white agents, white editors. And so I'm trying to disrupt those expectations a bit. Um, it's quite really lovely to see, to hear, to see, to see you model for us this kind of creative critical approach to actually scholarship. Uh, uh, and also I think one of the things I was enjoying hearing you uh, respond to questions was the way that the market actually impacts the form mm -hmm. that we also end up uh, kind of having to live with and, and challenge. So please uh, join me in thanking Thank Chris Patterson for this. Thank you. Thanks. I'll stick around for a bit. Sure.